Hey guys, welcome to Beyond Ink podcast. So today we're going to be talking about the secret that most artists don't use. And we're also going to be talking about how far do you think you could go in your goals and things that you really wanted in your business, life, whatever, if you weren't doing it alone. That's what we'll be talking about today. Yeah, awesome. And obviously I'm joining today, Ricky Jr., as always. Yep, Ricky Jr. <laughs> okay, so yeah, uh, I guess let's so, just let's just get into it. Yep. Yeah, okay, so what, what's the number one secret? Okay, so the secret is not really a secret at all. But most people would say if you want to have a secret or you want to hide something, you put it where? In plain, plain sight. sight. That's right. That's right. Plain sight. So it's branding. Most people don't understand about branding. What, what is what is branding? So Just start there. Like, okay. what is it? Okay. So the easiest way to think of branding, because you have personal branding, you have company branding, or you have both. But let's just say the number one way to describe branding that I feel is the easiest is to say your personality, like who you are, what you do, what you stand for. So like, let's, let's, let's think about this. Like if I say mother Teresa, you know exactly what she stands for. Mm -hmm. She was somebody who gave back her whole life. It seemed like her entire life till the day she died, she yeah. continued to help um, people that were underprivileged in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Now let's say uh, Ted Bundy. Yeah, I know that guy. Yep. You know who he is. You know what he did. You know what he stood for. It's kind of like that. Like, And you're saying that's his brand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your brand, whether you want to believe it or not, it's it's what you are. It's who it's, you know, it's what you do and who yeah. you stand for and, and or yeah. what you stand for. Like, for instance, America. What's America's slogan? You know, the mm -hmm. American dream. Yeah. You know, and then you go to Nike, just do it. What's Nike about, mm -hmm. you know? They, but it, most people believe that branding is is like your slogan, mm -hmm. your logo, your company name. It's not. It's really what you do and who you are that resonates with your tribe of mm -hmm. your tribe of people. You know, Seth Godin has a great book called Tribes. I would recommend anybody who wants to learn about this to pick it up. And why is this, you know, why is this so important? It's important because if you try to be everything or something to everybody, you'll be nothing to, to you know, everybody. That's basically what happens. You mm -hmm. have to know who who your tribe and who your people are and, and knowing that and staying true to it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I, a really simple way that it was told to me like a year or two ago about like just defining branding, it's like if you had your dream client, okay, and you ever seen like where it, it like you get prompts and it's like, oh, what's the first thing you think of? It would be like whatever your name is or whatever your brand or your company is, what would you want to be the synonym? Mm -hmm. Like what's the synonym? Basically, what are you remembered for? Mm -hmm. If people closed their eyes and uh, thought of an image, what would they think of when they thought of you? Right. That is what your brand is. Right. And uh, I think brand is like, it's a great tool, but if you're not utilizing it, it's also dangerous. Yeah. Because right. if people you're not- People will fill in the blanks exactly. on their own thoughts. And this, exactly. Th listen, you, this you is- You let people one, assume it. Yeah. Listen, this is one of those things that- for anybody who's listening, all you guys that are out there and girls that are out there listening, please listen to me. For many years, I was like, oh, branding. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. No big deal. Oh, yeah, branding. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't until I really began to develop and understand branding and realize what it does and how that actually really can move you forward uh, as a business or even as a personal brand as to who you are. You know, it, there's mm -hmm. it, it made such a huge difference once I really began to understand it. Yeah, uh, I, I have a great story about this, and like, mm -hmm. it's like specifically with tattooing. It's how how I like doubled my clientele by charging more. Yep, I doubled my clientele by charging more. Mm -hmm. um, and if you know, if anybody doesn't know, I started tattooing at 18, uh, and by the time I was 19, 20, um, I had a pretty good body of 
work and a and pretty good clientele. Um, but I just couldn't get people to to stick, if that makes sense. Mm. And uh, one of the things that we had talked about at the time was you're young and like people don't trust you and you're not confident. And I, like we began to look into areas of my career that I'm not confident, right? And one of them was in the way that I priced. So I'm putting out work equally, if not better, than most of the people in the area, for sure. Um, but I was charging significantly less. And uh, what we kind of settled on is, why is this work so good, but he's so cheap? Mm -hmm. And it's something that you don't think about, but um, I, I really... Uh, I kind of leaned into that. I charged, you know, marginally more, not not a crazy amount more, but mm -hmm. the going rates of everybody else and everybody mm -hmm. from that point. I, I think it's just the impression. It's the brand that I'm giving off. Yeah. Like I'm doing all this great work and I'm doing it for real cheap. And there's other people who are doing real good work and it's really expensive. They're hard to get in with. It builds a brand of where people want them. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. You're, you're building a yeah. need. Uh, so for the client, yeah, yeah. So so listen listen to this. So there was a guy who owned a uh, chic boutique, and all he sold was handbags, uh, high end handbags, and like purses. Okay, so he was talking to his staff, and he was like, "Listen, guys, you don't have to sell this. It has a brand." And they didn't quite understand what he said. And he said, for the next three days, this is a real story. <laughs> for the next three days, we are going to uh, lower the price of every single handbag and let's see what happens. And they lowered it, I think, by, I think it was like 50 or 60%. It mm -hmm. was something that I thought was ridiculous. Yeah, I was yeah. like, this is ridiculous. Anyways, of the people that came in, okay, only 20% bought just saw it and bought it with exactly how that it was, what mm -hmm. the price was. Then there was 50% that when the people started to walk out, they were like, hey, and let them in on the thing. Like, hey, you know that these bags are actually blank, blank, blank amount, and we're testing something or we're wanting to see who would purchase. Mm -hmm. And those 50% basically said, I did not purchase because the price was so low. So I thought that mm -hmm. there was a... Um, What's wrong uh, with it? Yeah, like there was something wrong with was the zipper. Or? Was there? Yeah, was there something wrong with the? You know, there was something on the inside of the bag, or was it a, a phony, a bootleg? Yeah. And yeah. then once they told them, no, 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 it's not. We just lowered the price so that I could show them that they sell. The people basically told them, no, 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 no. I wanted to pay X amount because that's the quality of what the brand is, and that's how it makes me feel when mm -hmm. I wear, you know, a Chanel or when I wear, you know, uh, those type of purses. They know that you know that's the status that it, exactly, that, they, yeah. that they're portraying. Yeah, that's the brand. That's yeah. what it is. And then the other, I think it was like thirty percent. They just uh, they just said no. They they weren't interested or yeah. whatever. But let's just think about it. It was fifty percent that were going to walk out. That they recouped the sell. They still gave them the discount. Yeah, yeah. But they said legitimately, I'm not buying it because of the price. Yeah. That brings me. The to, brand changed. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That mm -hmm. brings me to Nike. When you buy a pair of shoes or you buy a T-shirt or you buy anything from Nike, there's no sales agent coming up to you saying, hey, do you want to buy this shoe? You know, we can ship it to you. We can. It's a brand. They've gone beyond the sales. They've mm -hmm. said, this is who we are. Just do it. We work with professional athletes. Mm -hmm. We work with people who want to be inspired to do something bigger than themselves, speaking athletically. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's what a brand okay. actually does. Yeah. If you can tell who you are and what you're about, you create what's called a tribe. You create a certain amount of people. And that's the thing that I think people think. They think that they have to have tens of thousands of clients or doing what they're doing, but they, they don't. Yeah, so, so how, does this, how does this come back to tattoo artists or, or just artists and business owners in general? Yeah. So yeah. How, how do they utilize this? So, for instance, Kevin Kelly, he wrote a, a paper talking about a true, what's called a true fan. Okay? Mm -hmm. So what is a true fan? Let's, let's talk about that. So you have uh, small groups of bands and stuff like that that are all around that people travel to. 
Uh, they buy their T-shirt. They buy, you know, buy buy their uh, EPs. They buy everything from them. Though that's considered quote unquote a true fan. Mm-hmm. If you have a thousand of those, just a thousand true fans, yeah, you're good to go. Yeah, who yeah. who will <laughs> remark about you? They will consider you remarkable. Meaning mm-hmm. they will tell other people. They will do that. That is a tribe. That is the people. That is your people. The quicker you know who you are. And what you do and, and um, who you want to, to serve or sell your product to or whatever, the quicker that you will find your tribe and they will become that thousand, you know, true brand, you know, mm-hmm. as to what as to, you know, what it is that you're doing. Like, for instance, let's talk about uh, Toys R Us. Most people know if you're too young, maybe Google it or whatever, but most people know <laughs> Toys R Us. But... Toys R Us was a bankrupt company, basically. Mm-hmm. But people don't know that they sold, I think, a couple of years ago for $6.6 billion. How do you and, – and right now they're putting them in Macy's. They're putting mm-hmm. them back into Macy's all across the country. Oh, like a JCPenney's Sephora type of – like yeah. inside? Well, yeah, the- yeah, like me and, me and another guy were talking about it. I think it was Alberto. We were talking about it, and we, he was like, yeah, why wouldn't they just start Macy's Toys? Well, because it, that brand, that name, think about mm-hmm. it. You sold a bankrupt company, you know, that went through tons of strife and hard yeah. problems for six point six billion dollars because that name means something. Yeah. I grew up buying from Toys R Us. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, when it closed, you probably don't remember, but I remember. I'm being like, wow, that sucks. No, that I it remember. I, yeah. yeah, I was Toys yeah. R Us. All, I was yeah. a Toys R Us. Fucking kid. Yeah, huh? Toys R Us. Uh, I was there. Was it, fan? No, nah, Toys R Us kid. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Toys R Us kid. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to grow up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, bringing it back to tattoo artists and franchisors and stuff like that. Like, <coughs> how do you think? Sorry. No, you good. Get it out. <coughs> Get it out. It's Florida. It's, right, it's a cold Florida winter. <laughs> um, no, so, you know, how would a tattoo artist utilize something like branding to stand out. Say it again. How would like, it? like how, how would they use it to stand out? A tattoo artist or uh, somebody who owns a tattoo studio or any business, like how are they actually going to execute branding? Like do you have mm-hmm. any tips or things? Yeah. So let, yeah. So first it's studying, it's studying and understanding how to say what you want to say. Okay. So you want to just ask yourself a couple of questions. If I was a color, what color would I be? Now, most people don't know, like green, Rolex uses green. Mm-hmm. Um, Tiffany uses that off. You Tiffany know, green, blue. Tiffany blue, green. Yeah. Those, green is a color of wealth. That's what, it, that's what it does. Then you want to think about fast food. It's either red and white or red and yellow. And that's mm-hmm. because it, it gives a... Uh, a sense of fast, quick, Mm -hmm. and also like red and yellow. People say like ketchup, mustard. Yeah. I know they say like red is a food related. 100%. um, Like uh, that's why like hot plates and stuff, they put red lights under them. Yep. Because they're like, ah, if there's going to be Sid food, like food sitting here for a while, at least it's going to look appetizing in the red light and yada, yada. So, so yeah, that's what those colors do. So I would say, what color would you be? Study what the colors mean and how they resonate with your client. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, but you want to know who you are. You don't. You don't necessarily want to pick a color for your client. You want to pick a color for who you are. Yeah, for what your message is. What yeah, your, for what, yeah, yeah, for who you are. Because you're going to have to be that person. And if you fake it, you're eventually going to trip up. You know, you're eventually mm-hmm. going to trip up. Like let's 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 just talk about the face of certain people. You have people that talk about this best ingredients, better ingredients, better pizza, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. That's and I don't, Yeah, and I don't know exactly what he said. I don't remember. I have no idea. But I know he said something that was not on that ain't better, better ingredients. People. Yeah. It that was wasn't not, better people. It was not good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> yeah. and so he had to go. Yeah. That wasn't you know Papa what I'm John. That was so, Papa yeah, out of so, business. So be honest to who you are yeah. because it's, it's, it's going to come out. At yeah. some point, you know, you can only fake the funk for so long. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's, it's going to come out. So be the color. You know, look at what the color is. Like blue, blue is a calming atmosphere. Most spas use it. Mm-hmm. Um, telephone companies use it. Um, there's lots of that. Okay, then now let's go. Now the next question you would ask yourself is, if I was a song or if I was music, what music would I be? 
You know, if you're a tattooer, you might be punk rock, man. That might be your thing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but if you're a tattooer who does fine line, elegant work and stuff like that, and, you know, with flowers and stuff mm -hmm. like that, hey, listen, you, you might just be yeah. a little bit more calming. You might enjoy yeah. classical or whatever. I don't yeah, know. Maybe not black and red, maybe more gold and white. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, yeah. that's... That's, you know, kind of like your, your song of, you know, what's your brand, mm -hmm. you know, what it is. And then what is your slogan? Like if you could only say a couple of words, what would you say to that person? You know, like Nike is just do it. You know, mm -hmm. what was Toys R Us? Um, um, where you can be a kid. I, right? That I, was I, it. Yeah. Toys R Us where you can, can be a kid. We can fact check it. Yeah, I believe that's what it yeah, was. We'll yeah, but yeah. Toys R Us was when you could, where you could be a kid. America, what is America's slogan? The American dream. You know what I'm saying? It's the American dream. So you want to know? What's it say there? You get it? Um, I'm yeah. pulling it. I'm pulling it. Hold on. Wow, 1948. That's when the yeah. first Toys R Us opened. Yeah. So what were you like? 30, 35. <laughs> Uh, it, it was when you where you could be a kid. So okay, so there's there's a bunch of them yeah. that have been over the years. So yeah. we'll just go through all of them. So I don't want to grow up. Yep. Come on, let's play. Yep. Uh, the world's joy store, Toys R Us tours, toy stores. It's worth the journey. The world's greatest toy store. Uh, make all their wishes come true. And then Toys R Us, where kids are the big deal. So, yeah, you, you, you mean I don't want to grow up. Yeah, I don't want to yeah, grow up. That's, yeah, that's yeah, the tagline yeah. you're talking about. So, yeah. So uh, you want to know that about yourself. Mm -hmm. you know? So we have color. We have music. We have your slogan. You have your, your, and then you also have your company name. Mm -hmm. what, what's your company? Like, let's talk about a little bit about, like, Fine Ink. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, Fine Wine. You have Fine Beer. You have fine dining, you mm -hmm. have fine art, fine ink. You know, that's what I yeah. was. I was an artist and I moved directly, you know, to that. Mm -hmm. And what does what does fine mean? The definition is of high quality or or exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to be. That's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be high quality or exceptional. You know, I wanted to be somebody like that, and that was what I stood for. So that's why I named it that. Mm -hmm. You want to think through, you know, yeah. those, those type of things. And then, you know, what's the overall tempo of your emotion? Mm -hmm. You know, I know that. I, I know, and again, like I said, I heard this for years and just kind of listened to it and kind of moved on and didn't it really. It seems like something that's not very important. Well, it's, it's like if I'm a, like me yeah. as a tattoo artist, I'm like, oh, well, if I just do the best tattoos ever, they're going to come. And, and, and there's, there's, there's some, truth to it, yeah, but there's, it's not. There's validity to that. But this is what I would, this is what I say to a lot of people because we have fabulous artists that work for us. And they do say that. They're like, well, man, I just, I just want to be good. And that's all that, that's all that matters. And if yeah. I'm good, then I'll have the people that come to me. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you a question. Let's say you do nothing but portraits, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's what you do. How many times have you had a client, which you do a lot of portraits, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. a decent amount. Yeah. yeah. Well, you used to. Now used you kind of switched yeah, off. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. To do, so portraits. But I've that's been your, there in my career, yeah. That's your thing. You're doing portraits. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many times have you had somebody call you and then say, Hey, I uh, I love your work. I want to get script all the way across my chest. Or M more times than they want a portrait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 that, yeah. and that a big part of that is branding, mm -hmm. because you're calling the wrong tribe to what you want. If they look into you and see like, oh, that's what he does, that's who he is, that's what he talks about, that's mm -hmm. what he enjoys doing, and you're telling the story of why you enjoy doing portraits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just posting photos of portraits and being like, these are my tattoos. Mm -hmm. People that, that's see not, it and go, yeah. oh, he, he can do a portrait. He can definitely do lettering, Yeah, right? That's not a, yeah, that's not a video of me saying, that's um, right. hey, guys, I just wanted to talk about why I specifically do portraits. Yep. Why, why, did I, why did I specialize in portraits and pick that to be the only thing that I like to do? Yep. 
Yep. Exactly. It's a declaration. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not you're not cutting anybody out, but at yeah. the same time, you're explaining why you enjoy doing what you do, mm-hmm. and whoever it resonates with will follow in with you on their on yeah. as a tribe. Yeah, exactly. You know, so that that's a huge portion to branding, but that's why I call it a secret because it's in plain sight. And I, for so long, I just totally ignored it until about six years ago when I really started developing a brand and I really mm-hmm. started knowing, you know, who my tribe is and, and who do I resonate with and who, uh, you know, who resonates with me, who mm-hmm. actually gets me. You know, those were some of the things that I started, yeah. you know, thinking about. Is there a level of that in branding? Like, uh, do you think – so – What do you mean a level of that? So, okay, we're talking to business owners who already own businesses mm-hmm. or tattoo artists who obviously yeah, already are have, tattooers, yeah, so right? Let me, let, me, let me explain that. So you do have company branding, which if it's a, a group of people, a company, mm-hmm. um, and then you also have personal branding. Like let's talk about um, name a Kardashian. Kylie. She has her own brand. She is her own brand. Mm-hmm. And... So you have to understand, do you want to be a company brand or Mm -hmm. do you want to be a personal brand? Yeah. What what, what are the pros and cons? If Kylie, heaven forbid, is not on this earth anymore, that brand kind of stops. Mm -hmm. This is why Kylie, I think it was Kylie, started doing something with makeup. or Yeah, she has the biggest, at the time that she opened it, it was like the biggest makeup line in the world for a while at least. Yeah, so they opened up a brand. So mm-hmm. now if Kylie is not here anymore, the brand continues on. Yeah, because she's yeah. aligned something with yeah, her so that, that But a, a pro to having a personal brand is you're the ambassador. Mm-hmm. You can say uh, what you want, however you want, when you want. Well, you can't say whatever you want. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, unless you, that's your brand. Yeah, unless that's your brand. You heard uh, of Alex Jones? Yeah. He says whatever he wants. Yes, right, exactly. Well, <laughs> he, he pays for it too. But anyways... You, you're right. Like that's your, you know, that's your brand, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. and it's, I would say relatively easier to build your personal brand than a company brand, yeah. but a company brand just may be a little bit more sustained, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the long yeah, run, or, yeah. you know, because it's not yeah. limited. So right. yeah. Like if we roll that back a little bit, like with that in mind, regardless if it's a company or if it's a person, just uh-huh. the co- kind of the concept of branding, mm-hmm. right? What would be advice for somebody who isn't starting at nothing? So, like, we talk about Fine Ink, and um, when Fine Ink was started, we understood the message, but it would be 15 years until Fine Ink was branded. Right. Really, yeah. really. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, yeah. there's people who have specific styles of tattooing, but no brand. Like, is it okay to kind of start in the middle? You know what I mean? Like, because, you know, there may be people that, uh, like resonate with their work already do you think Mm -hmm. it's something where it's like you know now that they have that they should just start doing that thing or should they kind of go back and just reset almost at the beginning again and say what they want and start from there you get you get the question yeah Yeah. so the question is is that you're already kind of an established artist yeah and yeah like you're in the middle how do you start branding in the middle yeah you know Uh, like without all the pre-thought yeah yeah that that's that's the perfect way that's the perfect way to start. Uh, you know, I, I would think that would be at a benefit. The first thing you could do, and I'm just thinking off the top mm-hmm. of my head. First thing you could do is engage with your clients. Engage with your clients. Mm-hmm. Just asking a simple question. Now think about this. Just asking, just asking a simple question of, if I was a color, what color would I be? Just, just putting that out, and and again, just putting out a, you know, if you do black and gray, how many people do you think are gonna say you do black and gray? <laughs> They're gonna be like, what are you talking about? You don't do color. Yeah. But it's you're real. The thing is this: you're realizing that they understand it. It's not about mm-hmm. you. It's about your client. It's about your customer. Yeah. Do they know who I am? Mm-hmm. Do they think that I'm, for lack of a better term, but an exaggerated. Uh, example, do they think I'm Ted Bundy? Mm-hmm. 
do they think I'm they Kylie think, They Jenner's? think you're Alex Jones. Yeah. <laughs> That's who they fucking think you are. <laughs> they think you're fucking Alex Jones. What's he always say? What's uh, the, the little thing? They're, they're he's putting like, chemicals in the they're water. They're putting chemicals in the water. Turn the frogs gay. Yeah. <laughs> you got to say it. Say Cut. it. <laughs> Cut. <clears throat> so, you know, are they, <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Are they Kylie Jenner's? Are they themselves? You know? <laughs> That ask those ask those questions. Just put those questions out. Man, I wish I wish you could make like a, I wish you could make a questionnaire mm-hmm. of like what to ask yourself to yeah. build your brand. Like if there were like a, a twenty well, can, question. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, you know, there's basically. I mean, we don't got to go into them all no, no, right no, now. No, but. but no, yeah. But that's a whole lesson. But there's basically ten questions that you do want to ask yourself. Okay, so uh, people have done this. Sort maybe of thing. In a, maybe we can put in a link below. Where they can see the, yeah, we'll, they can, we'll where they can see them. We'll research some stuff and, and put some stuff in the description so people can read more about it for sure. Yeah, yeah, because, because understanding what your clients or customers see you as mm-hmm. is a huge advantage to, to knowing who your tribe is and how, in, how to connect with those people. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's huge. Okay. Um, Hold so on. Can yeah, I, hey, no, 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 no. So we we talked about like tribes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, talk a little bit about building. I guess I guess building fine ink. Okay, yeah. Like talk a little bit more about that. I I know that so, we um. Well, okay. So for instance, we, we talk about a little bit about that with branding and stuff like that. So when I started fine ink. I, I told you that I started with fine ink because fine means of yeah. you know of exceptional mm-hmm. quality. You know that's that's what it was, and mm-hmm. that's what I wanted to be. I wanted my name to say, you know, what I wanted to do, who I wanted mm-hmm. to be. I wanted it to say that. But then, if you think about it, um, you have the acronym, which is Fine Ink Studios Tattoos, mm-hmm. which is F. I S T. I S T. It's a fist. So what did I what did I want that acronym for? It's almost like a yin and a yang. You know, I wanted to be, you know, that fine person, high quality, but at the same time I wanted to stand for what I stood for, mm-hmm. which was, you know, being a tried and true studio that developed good artists, that made good artwork, mm-hmm. and that was basically standing up for what I want to do, whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you think about that, but all of that thought went into developing that yeah. name. I didn't just, you know, I didn't, that was all yeah. created, mm-hmm. you know. Look at people's names. Look at people's, uh, you know, like uh, like Chanel... Uh, it's like two C's backwards, and her name is Chanel Coco, and mm-hmm. that people say that that's what the two C's are for is Chanel Coco, but actually she was an orphan, and the church that she stayed in had a stained glass window, and in the pattern it had two C's backwards, and, and she always just always stuck out there. Yeah, she always saw that as Chanel, yeah. you know, or whatever it was, and then yeah. she just thought, you know, that was from when I was a kid, and mm-hmm. she used that as her logo, yeah, Chanel Coco. But it was actually from where she came from. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. People think these things out. They think them through. The more intent that you put into something, just like I always say, you can you can be out there tattooing and just doing what you're doing and being a wandering generality. Or you can be a meaningful specific and you can plan and say exactly who Mm -hmm. you are and what you're about. And when you do that, that's when traction begins to happen, whether you want to believe it or not. That's Mm -hmm. what that's what happens. So with Fine Ink, uh, I started with the name. That was my first thing that I did. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a company come in called uh, Storyland Studios Mm -hmm. or Blue Sky. Um, they have two different names. And I remember being in a room with my team. You were there. Okay, so yeah, I know a little bit about this story. So like yeah. at this point, we're already um, – we're tightening up the brand and gearing up for franchising. Yes, let's exactly. Ro- let's roll back a little bit okay. and talk about why did Finding decide to franchise? So Finding decided me – yeah, uh, I was basically really you. Yeah. You were finding yeah. there was nothing. Yeah. It was yeah. just you and yeah. you know, obviously the tattooers that worked on it. Right. You. So, I had tattoos that would. I had tattooers that would come and go, and you know, do their own things. They would go and 
open a private studio. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, after a year or two, they would kind of close that and come back or whatever. Um, or I would even have um, artists that had come to me and wanted to open studios. And, but, you know, that there's a reason why. Let's think about it this way. In our industry as artists mm-hmm. in general, our cliche or our slogan is a starving artist. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you can think of another artist one, go ahead. But there's not one that's more recognizable yeah. than a starving artist. Yeah, it's and, like a whole thing, right? Yeah. yeah. And the reason that our artists are quote unquote starving is because they're doing what they're doing for passion, not mm-hmm. necessarily monetary or money gain, which mm-hmm. I totally get that and understand that. Um, because I used to be that way. I was that way too. Um, so they're doing it really for, you know, that that reason, for passion and what they love to do. But the problem is, is that if you're not going to study or you're not going to understand business, um, you might want to stay out of it. I mean, this is the statistic. 70% of all tattoo studios in America close within two years. Yes, yeah, when they op- of opening is that higher than like regular business statistics? Uh, well, I think it is a little bit, but there's a lot mm-hmm. that close. Most yeah, of I know them, like lots of businesses. Yeah, they kind say of, that yeah they yeah they say like eighty percent of all businesses in five years will be closed. Okay, it's a five year. Yeah, I yeah. forget. Yeah, and it's yeah. actually it's your the statistic I'm thinking about is uh how successful you'll be if you pass five years. Right. Not yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So. So you know that that's that that's kind of the thing. So in doing that, I knew that you were coming up as an artist. Mm-hmm. I knew that Denzel was coming up as mm-hmm. an artist. I knew that I had uh, Jesse working with me, mm-hmm. who was coming up as an yeah. as an artist. She was she was she had already been Sam. in the game a while. Uh, yeah, Sam. I had all these friends and artists that I just I just wanted them if they wanted to own a slice of the pie that they could. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I always felt that it was tragic that when you become a tattoo artist and then you get in the chair, there's no insurance, uh, there's no 401k, there's no retirement, there's, you know, there's, there's none of that. So when you're done out of the chair, you're just done. I mean, you get hof- nothing. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully you've saved, hopefully you've done what you needed to do and you've paid into mm-hmm. your insurance or your retirement and stuff like that. But really there was yeah, more like or less once, you're done. Once you there's sat nothing. in the chair. For year one to year twenty, that yeah. was it. There was yeah. n- there was no advancement. Yeah, you've hit the peak. Yeah, I I I personally I couldn't do that. That was not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something more than that. Um, I enjoyed tattooing people. I enjoyed helping artists. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's so why how I, was franchising the answer? Well, because now it's a co-op. You know, it's something where you're working with me. I'm developing systems. That, have, that I had already been working on for over 12 to 15 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm developing a brand. I'm developing uh, all of the know-how as far as like the money speaking, mm-hmm. you know, speaking part of it, understanding what POS systems to use, understanding what standard operating procedures that should be used. It's basically a co-op of artists that all are helping each other. Like right mm-hmm. now, I think we have over 130, maybe 150, yeah, somewhere yeah, in there. Yeah, we're, we're right in that area, yeah, yeah. for sure, so including all, piercers yeah, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, so all those artists, we get to talk on a, on a daily basis and share back and forth. People want to know. Mm-hmm. Like I have people all the time, like on my DMs, like, how are you growing your company? How, do you, how are you doing that? How are you? Well, I'm going to tell you how. I, I, just like I think it was Warren Buffett that said, he said, the quickest way to be successful in, in business is just to give somebody a job. The more people that you can give a job to or help, mm-hmm. the more successful you become. Well, we've given, you know, a hundred and whatever it is amount of artists, you know, uh, trying to help them yeah. as contractors and, and giving them, you know, basically a job mm-hmm. in some way. Now, 
there's a certain responsibility that comes along with that too. You know, like yeah. it has to be a quality job. You can't be trying. Yeah, you can't to, just you give know, them. Yeah, you know. yeah. You have to. You're responsible for them making money. You know, you're mm-hmm. responsible for these things. So, but that's what it is. That's what we did. We put that co-op together. For instance, like the the certain suppliers that we work with. Because we purchase so much, we get deeper discounts than what you're going to get on your own as some small. Yeah. So immediately, studio. if you're like, if if you're a finding partner. <laughs> You're getting, you know, what we talked about earlier, which was the brand that's mm-hmm. already defined for you. Yes. You're getting uh, all of our connections and all of our systems and how we run it. Yep. And then, obviously, we put in a lot of time doing support. Yep. And obviously, we do a lot of time doing media. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like, it's like the cliche, like you're you're in business uh, for yourself. But, but not, not by, by yourself. yourself. That's right. Yeah. And and here's the most important thing I would say at this time. It won't always be true, but at this time, you're in an emerging brand in an emerging industry. This mm-hmm. industry, most people think that, oh, that's it. No, it's growing. Mm-hmm. It's just taking off. Yeah. You know, and you're at the ground level of getting into mm-hmm. a brand and a company I, I to tr- develop. Yeah, I I Try not to get political, yeah. But I, I just feel like uh, there's lots of people that don't understand that someday soon there's going to be somebody with more money than Finding has and less give a fuck about anything that's going on in this industry, and they're going to come. <coughs> and if there's not somebody who cares that's far enough ahead of them, they're going to wipe the entire thing clean. I, I feel like just lots of people don't understand that. Um, You know, we have to make sacrifices, obviously, uh, with certain things about the culture and the tradition of it to do it. Um, But at least we care. At least we care because there's – and it's going to happen, and it's going to happen in the next five years. Like that's a declaration. In the next five years, there will be somebody who has more money and less care for this industry who are going to try to do what we're doing. Let's think about it this way. When I when I started tattooing, um, which I wouldn't say is a long time ago, you know, whatever it is, 18, 20 years, whatever it was, when I started, nobody really taught anybody anything. Mm-hmm. Like you couldn't you couldn't go online and look at something. Yeah. You know, look for something, and it you know there's still a, there's still a um, a certain level of gatekeeping in our community, mm-hmm. you know, for sure. But you can go online right now and you can watch people tattoo and they'll they'll tell you everything. They'll explain to you how they're doing it. They'll, no, like they'll not paid any. stuff. There's yeah, a guy. Yeah, they're just. Um, uh, he's his name's a uh, uh, Lil B. Uh huh. Who has a YouTube? It's it used to be big a bunch of years ago when I was learning mm-hmm. how to tattoo and it was just, I could sit at mm-hmm. two a.m. and just watch one of the best guys in yeah. in the world just tattoo. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, it's already opening up. You're seeing lots of change, and you're seeing lots of things like that happen. My thing is is that we need to get ahead of it. Mm -hmm. We need to educate ourselves, and we need to get ahead of that. And that way we have as much control of it as we can. Mm -hmm. And that's that's why I franchised my company, was so that I could protect the brand, and the people who were interested in working with me, I could explain what that brand was, who mm-hmm. we were, what we stood for, and and if that was what you were cool with and you liked it, you could come on board with us, mm-hmm. and you could you know be part of the brand, own your own your own studio, and begin to help other artists the way that you had been helped, mm-hmm. and then just develop. Just remember, you know, nobody's. Working, I mean, you love tattooing, and you do it, and, and you're passionate about it. Yeah. But ultimately, you have to pay your bills. You know, you have to pay your bills. And yeah. you have a lifestyle. Everybody has a different, you know, uh, level of lifestyle that they want to be at. Mm-hmm. You know, some people like a tent. Some people like a tiny house. <laughs> some people like a regular house. Some people like a big house. Some people like a, f- a freaking mansion. Yeah. Whatever it is, whatever your lifestyle is, that's really what you're doing it for. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to take your kids somewhere and be able to afford it and you want to go to this place, that's that's really what it's for. Mm-hmm. So by franchising and allowing artists who didn't have a lot of business understanding 
and being able to come in and being taught about about business mm-hmm. and how it works and how to uh, develop themselves as well as their own studio, their own finding studios, mm-hmm. and how to do that, and then if they wanted to recreate it again and again and in, mm-hmm. in you know three to five times, and then the amount of money that you're making, I just I yeah. I, I I wanted to do it. I had to do it because I felt you know a certain. Uh, commitment mm-hmm. to the people that had worked with me that, you know, hey, look, it's time for me to go open my studio. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, they had been super loyal to me, super loving, super, mm-hmm. you know, great people. But sorry, man, this is what I have to do, mm-hmm. you know. And sometimes, you know, like the question would come up, you know, would you open one with me? Would you open a studio with me? Well, that's the purpose of franchising. It protects you. It protects your brand. It protects your systems. It mm-hmm. protects your strategies. It protects everything to where you're not just in business with somebody. And also, that's illegal to do that over and over again. Yeah, yeah. It, it's called a pyramid. But so I went ahead and franchised, you know, took a good amount of my money and my savings and franchised and uh, sat down with a company and did it. It was the same company that franchised uh, Hand and Stone. Uh, Kiki's Breakfast. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, let's see what else did they do. They did Burger Fi. Yeah, uh, these guys did, are franchises, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's the franchises that they had helped develop mm-hmm. as you know, as uh, franchisees and yeah, brands yeah. and stuff like that. So, but that's basically why I did it. Uh, and I'll say again, it took off quicker than I thought. I was, I was, sure, yeah. I was quite shocked at how quickly it took off. And who actually wanted well, to be part of it? We're at a point where we're purposely putting brakes on. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. We're like, yeah. hey, listen, we need to we need to make sure this is exactly how we need it before it gets as far as it's about to go. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the um, yeah. So we're we're slowing down because we only have X amount of people to do what we can. And slowing down sounds like what does that mean? Slowing down. Well, twenty twenty four, we already have seven that we're opening. Yeah. So. Like when I say it's slowing a, it, down, well, it's not I mean, slowing down. It's almost more of a like the potential energy concept, mm-hmm. like where it's like a, you know, if you had a slingshot, right, and you want it to go as far forward as you want, you wouldn't flick it forward. You would pull it all the way back as far as you could. Yeah, and that's what we're doing. Yep, we're building up all the potential energy, all of our systems, mm-hmm. everything that we need to do to be better to yeah. then release it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, if if. Um, Let's say somebody's going into business uh, and they want to open their own tattoo studio. You know, there's there's things that they need to think about. And the first one would be, and this is with any artist, doesn't just have to be a tattoo artist. It's probably with any business. Yeah, it's probably with any business. Yeah. But you know, some of the things that you want to think about is you want to think about it as just a business. You don't want to think of it about uh, about it as oh, I'm doing tattoos, or I'm doing oil paintings, Mm -hmm. or I'm doing this. Just find what other businesses do and just do what they do. Mm -hmm. Just institute it into your personal brand or what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, Most people complicate it, and they're they're like, oh, well, yeah, that works for that, but that won't work for tattoo artists, or that won't work for Mm -hmm. uh, a fine artist. Yes, it will. Yeah, just it does, learn, yeah. learn learn about the business, you know, and the it, it's pretty simple in some ways, and I say that now because I've learned to reduce it down to a simplistic. Like most people, when they talk about business and developing and stuff like that, they go they go to such a level of like understanding that you're just like I do not so much jargon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do not understand what they're saying. I yeah. don't get that. So. What I did was is I I tried to reduce it down to where I understood it and to where I could teach it mm-hmm. to a ten year old. Mm-hmm. Here's here's how here's how it's done. This is what you do. But basically, you know, it really comes down to marketing and advertising and understanding about that. Understanding, you know, your brand inside mm-hmm. of that marketing and advertising, understanding business. What, when I say business, what do I mean? I mean the transaction of your service mm-hmm. or product to the person mm-hmm. and being able to talk. Just how we're talking now. Relationships, yep. really. Relationship. That's what business is. Most people are like, oh, he's doing business. 
Yeah, they like, think it's the numbers and it's the money and it's the this. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's the not, relationship. Yeah, the it's the relationship. It's the connection that you're that you're building with the person. Yeah. That whatever it is you're selling that product to, you know, like if you if you need skis, you're going skiing and you need skis. It's a relationship of how you actually get that product to them and who you are, and you know what you can do on top of that. You know. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, it's the finances. That's the hard part. That's the scary part. That's the part that most people, you know, fail on. And and how do we develop that and do that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I think of, uh, you know, when I think of why we would franchise, it kind of always, you know, I mean, I know there's various reasons, but what I think is the most important, like for me, when I think about my role, like w- why would I do all this marketing? And like, mm-hmm. why wouldn't we just open three or four more studios and make the same amount of money as if we opened 10 with 10 different people, right? Because obviously the margins are significantly smaller when you have a franchisee versus if you just open yeah, it yourself. So, so let, me, let me just stop you there. Yeah. So conceptually speaking, what you're saying is mm-hmm. we could have did this. We could have said, let's open 10 studios and let's have 100% of a grape. Yeah, yeah. Or we could franchise it and have 10% of a watermelon. Exactly. Let me say that again. We could open it ourselves and have 100% of a grape or we could have 10% of a watermelon. The 10% of a watermelon is a lot more work. You're yeah. only making 10% yeah. of that watermelon, yeah. but think how big it is, and the the support of that watermelon is on you. Exactly. It's on you and and, and the people that, that you get in business with. Yeah, like There's it, a lot I, more moving yeah. parts than a small grape yeah. and 10 yeah, studios. I mean, it's, and, it's no secret, right? It's yeah. no secret that it's significantly easier to train a manager to manage your studio than to train an entire business owner to own their own finance. <laughs> like you have to train somebody to manage, to market, to do finances, to think in a business-minded way, mm-hmm. to build connections with people, to uh, talk to their staff the correct way, mm-hmm. uh, to honor that they're contractors and not employees, mm-hmm. uh, which is hard for people coming out of other industries to mm-hmm. not respect that. That's yeah. hard to teach. Yeah. Um, if they're not a tattoo or a piercer, they have to learn to tattoo or pierce so that they know enough about it. Um, yeah. Even if they don't practice and do it daily, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's significantly more work to do to give somebody a franchise. Absolutely. But what makes it worth it to me is that the reason we franchised is about taking the opportunities that we can give to people and just making them the easiest that we can. Yep. And and there's something about quality when you take me and you and say, hey, we're going to open up 10 studios. The quality would be significantly less than if we said, hey, let's teach 10 people who don't have the opportunity to open a studio right now We're going to give them the opportunity and all the tools. Yeah. How much more inspired are they going to be to run their one studio versus us running our eighth and ninth? Yeah, absolutely. That's why that's the fran. That's why we franchised because it's about the culture. It's about the business. It's about tattooing. Mm -hmm. And the best thing for tattooing wasn't to open up ten finding studios. Mm-hmm. And and hire managers who get paid. Well, think, well, you know? think about this: the the word franchising comes from the French, and it means to free. That's what it means. You want to think about this. There's this kind of saying that's that's been going around a lot, and it's work in your business or work on your business, not in your business. Mm-hmm. That's essentially franchising. You know, if, if you're going to open a business yourself, you've heard people say, uh, what do you call it? You have to wear 10 different hats. Yeah. You have to be the customer service guy. You have yeah. to be HR, human resources. You have to be everything. The, you have to be you everything. You have to be the CPA. You have to be the bookkeeper. You have to be uh, inventory guy. You have to be everything. You name it, anything. Yeah. Now, that's true that you still have to be that. But to be able to have a system that is proven, that has worked time and time again, and here's the thing, I believe that the finances are probably higher doing it with a franchise than doing it alone. 
Oh yeah, like every studio generates yeah. more. Yes, absolutely. Well, and also like and the every savings studio's... that you get from the savings yeah. you get from the co-ops of, mm-hmm. of of suppliers. Yeah, you know your vendors that you're working with. Yeah, yeah. so it's just a it's just an interesting concept where without knowing what franchising is, I think that like you'd think that I don't know you'd think Fine Inc opened up twenty studios. Yeah, but that's almost not what happened. Finding gave their systems to twenty people yep. to open their own studios. That's right. And and you know it's just it's a concept that they'll you know everybody will learn over the next ten years because yep. like I said, like I said, I'm not fear mongering. Yeah. But in the next five years, mm-hmm. there's going to be a company who does not care, and they see it's called a blue sky concept. Yeah. Right. If you look in 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 the world of tattooing. We're going to say 90% of tattooers are like, oh, you shouldn't be franchising. That yeah. means nobody's doing it, Yeah, which would mean somebody who has a lot of money. Some and, slick business yeah, guy. Some, some slick guy business who, person yeah. is like, oh, there's nobody doing this? Yep. A- and, and they're going to be more successful than we will be because you want to know what they don't have that we do? Standards. Yep. They won't have standards. Yep. They'll market twice as much as us because they have more money. Mm-hmm. And what people don't understand about marketing is your market becomes the most relevant thing that people see. So right now, if you say say that again, so your market becomes the most relevant thing in that industry at the time. Okay. Okay. So if you subtract and you take quality, okay, the tattoo market obviously has a set standard of quality that most people will understand as standard. Right. Okay. Uh-huh. Now let's take every tattooer that is not as good as that. Okay. Uh huh. And you only take the top ten percent of tattooers that exist. That kind of top ten percent. Mm-hmm. You erase every photo of any other tattoo that exists except for that ten percent. Okay. That's mm-hmm. all people can consume is mm-hmm. Nico Hurtados and Steve Butchers. That's yeah. it. That's all yeah. they see all day. Yeah. They're going to walk into a tattoo studio and see me, and they're going to think I'm terrible. Yeah. Okay? Now, if you inverse that, let's say you had more money, okay? Let's say you had oh, I see. Y- you had the money to influence what the market's seen, mm-hmm. okay? Yeah. And this is where bigger person, more money before we get there yeah. is dangerous. Yeah, it's like the— um, Well, l- l- let me okay, get through ahead. the concept. Okay. So it would be like—it it would be them taking that— more money and running ads and having bigger media and having bigger anything than anybody else, they could set what the quality standard for tattooing is. They Mm -hmm. could set what the pricing is. All they have to do is reach more people than the industry has before. Mm -hmm. And this is an industry that's never really tried to reach people. Right. And in the way that it's tried to reach people, they do it in a way that isn't productive. So there's companies that do tons of things where they take people that have their, you know, eyes tattooed black and they got their Mm -hmm. head done and which is super intriguing and it gets tons of likes and tons of views. And that's why they do it because they're trying to generate money. They're trying to generate views. They're not trying to generate content that's really meaningful. Right. You know, they're doing it for it being viral. Yeah. Okay. And that's significantly easier than trying to do something with intention a lot of times. Yeah. It's so what I was going to say is, yeah, you're a hundred percent right. So putting it back into a different, this is why I tell everybody, think about business as nothing to do with tattooing. So it, I call it the Wawa syndrome. Mm-hmm. When Wawa came down south, man, they didn't come and say, let's put a couple of uh, gas stations or, you know, no, they came with a fierce vengeance, man, or yeah, whatever opened, you want to call it. They, they opened, opened ten tons of them. of them. So now think about it. You're at it. You pull up to a stoplight, okay, and you see... Uh, Gary's gas station, or you see Wawa, and you've never been to neither one, but you have seen so many Wawas, mm-hmm. you're going to turn right into Wawa. Exactly. Because you know what that brand is. You see it everywhere. You know what it is yeah. over and over and over again. And here's the thing. You could have turned into Gary's gas station, and that gas was 30 cents cheaper yeah. than Wawa. Yeah. But because and, and, there's so many. And that's why I think it's so important for us to get ahead. Yes. There needs to be somebody in the industry that's ahead of the next yep. person who doesn't care about tattooing. Yep. And that, and that's that's a and, good well, no, hold on, no, listen, that's a good point because we're doing this with a standard of trying to push the industry forward. Mm-hmm. Like we're doing it with a standard of 
I'm going to give back to my industry. Yeah. I'm going to help artists. They I'm going want to do, do the opposite. They yep. want to regress it back to yep. where it's the easiest way to make money. Yep. Yeah. It is just about money for yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. And and I think that it's a uh, it's just a wild concept that people don't understand that that that's going to happen, and that in a market that's so undersaturated, and looking at its growth projections, we're talking about it's going to triple. Yeah. Over the next five years. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure all the business analysts look at that and they're like, oh, there's nothing we'd like to get into yeah. about this. Yeah. And, and that's th- that's a big reason why we've made this podcast. Yeah, It's why Beyond Inc. exists. It's why yeah. the school exists. Because yeah. the concepts that we teach, we'd hope that uh, if you're a one-off studio, if you're a, a studio that has amazing artists who, yeah. you know, that's been your bread and butters. You guys are just the most excellent tattoo studio and that's what you strive for. Yeah. You need to practice these practices. Yep. Because when they drive past Wawa and they drive past Earl's gas station, they're going to understand the quality difference. They're going to understand the tradition difference Mm -hmm. because we've been doing it for years trying to market people to understand what the industry is like. Right. Okay? And I'm sorry, you know, uh, taping a dildo onto somebody's forehead to teach them how to tattoo is not a representable or commendable thing to push out into the public. So we don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and nobody should because it's time that tattooing gets real. Yeah. And if it doesn't legitimize and it doesn't get real, and I understand their traditions are amazing and they're great and there's certain things that are funny and there's certain things that are heartfelt and there's certain things that will have to get dropped off. Yeah. But yeah. it's either our industry decides as a collective now the things yeah. we're going to take or they're just going to get taken from us. Yep. And like I said, I'm not trying to fear monger. Uh, you know, I, that's not what I'm trying to do to say, you know, finding great because there's going to be people worse than us coming behind us. Yeah. It's because that's the why. Yeah. Well, I think and, and that, that, and that is true. That's, that's the, the why. why. That's the why. Because it, we could have been that person and decided against it. Yeah. Think of how much money, more money we've had if the first 10 studios we opened, we just hired a manager. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. We could have done what we were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. We could stop right now and do that. Yeah. Because there's nobody doing it. Well, so that, how long and, until that, somebody other, catches on? That and the other thing is this. We have people that are coming out now talking with us about franchising. And I think this is the part that people think we just give a franchise to anybody. Yeah. Like I mean, people don't know how well that we vet them and how we have what we call a discovery day. Mm-hmm. And that discovery day, they come and they talk with us and we talk with them about their values. What is it that they want yeah. to do? Who are they? And there are lots of times where we talk with those people and we're like, this person is not... We've turned away more people yeah. than we've taken on, for yeah. sure. This is not something that I feel comfortable with this person doing. Mm-hmm. I just I just don't. I, I just, you know, I just don't jive with them. Yeah. That's really what it comes down to. But yeah, so we're not just like franchise. You get a franchise. You want? Oh, you want to do it? Here you go. So if somebody's watching this, you know, before you think you can just call and say, "Hey, I want a franchise," you know, make sure you look at what you, you know what your brand is. Yeah. Who you what are. do you have? To do offer? you resonate with our tribe? Mm-hmm. You know, do you do you want to be a company that wants to grow? And number one is client care, mm-hmm. caring about the client and what they want to get as a tattoo, no matter how big, how small, you know, but being a professional. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of tattoo artists that are, you know, people that they don't do that, you know, Mm -hmm. and and I'm not saying that in a bad way. Like they just, not not that they don't do that, but they don't think about that. And they're like, look, man, I just want to do my tattoos. I don't want to get in that deep and all that. I mean, we have tons of artists like that. And I totally get that. I mean, I totally get that. But you you may not want to be at the head of the helm you know, of a ship steering it with that type of, uh, you know, understanding of, I just want to tattoo, man. I don't really want to talk to people. I don't exactly. want to answer the phone. I don't want, That's I not going to that. drive the industries yeah. forward for sure. Yeah. 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 So I, I know we had, um, we had the video you talked about, uh, you know, sixty thousand dollars in in debt painting. And yeah, you ruined your credit and all that. <laughs> um, w- Did not. But anyway, <laughs> fact check that. Yeah, um, Alberto, uh, we had a couple questions. I, I can't remember exactly what they were. If you could, yeah, yeah, if you could text that to me real quick. Let's uh, let's see. Let's take a look at what that is. 
So, yeah, here. I, uh, no, nah, you don't have the question there, so let's look at this. Okay, yeah, he sent it. So um, <coughs> the creature designer on – this is TikTok. Yeah, so the creature designer on TikTok says, I make masks, action figures, etc. in my off time. Okay. He's an he's a special effects artist and like a TV effects guy. Okay. Um, are you saying you could get those appraised and insured to convert those into assets? Absolutely. And, yeah. Yes, you can. Yeah. Where, did you have another question to it? No, 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 no. I was just uh. So yeah, that, that's it. Like uh, yeah, no. So it, so if that's a good. Basically, that's a, if you're doing sculpts and stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Listen. So that's a good question because he's thinking in terms of himself, his mm-hmm. industry, and what he does. Yeah. yeah. So let's go back because I, I think this is uh, what a lot of people didn't understand when I said that. And I think one of the number one things that they didn't understand was what is an asset? Mm-hmm. Like what is an asset? You know, that, that's, the, that's the key question or the key statement. Okay, an asset is anything that uh, does not depreciate but appreciates in value over time of having it. So let's let's talk about it this way. If you had a car, you purchased a car, okay? Mm-hmm. And you use the car to rent the car out. Mm-hmm. That then is an asset strategy. You're mm-hmm. using the car to make money. You're able to pay for the depreciation of the car, the maintenance of the car, and the note on the car, Mm -hmm. you know, the bill, how much it is, you know, what you owe on it. Mm -hmm. And then you're also able to make a small percentage on it. Yeah. Okay. And then what happens is with this asset, you use it for X amount of years, let's say five years. Okay. And you're renting the car out five years, five years, five years. Right. Mm -hmm. And then once the car has depreciated enough you're like, okay, I need a new car. We're going to start the whole cycle over again. Mm-hmm. You then can take that car, which is what car companies do, which is yeah. what dealerships do. Then they take that car and they sell it for the amount that they purchased it for, if not more. Now, remember, they've made money off of it, and they've also basically paid the entire uh, you know, yeah. financing on it or the, the note. Even mm-hmm. if they didn't finance it, they bought it you know, straight cash. Yeah whatever, uh, they now ha- they've made that much money back and made some. So now they get to sell the car again mm-hmm. for the amount that they purchased it for. This is, this is how an asset works. Mm-hmm. You know, there's assets and liabilities. So anything that you can turn into an asset, you can leverage against it or you can borrow against it. Yeah. You can or use the banks it will leverage. at least consider it. Yeah, they'll at least look at it. Yeah. I mean, it's not a surefire thing. Yeah, it's obviously. not a surefire thing. But also, there's there's uh, private investors that do the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, if you like, for instance, let's say I don't know what it is, and I'm just I'm just making this up. I I, I have no idea. Let's say you have the original Freddy Krueger hand that was in the movie. Yeah, that was made. Yeah. Yeah. What is the value of that? What is what is it worth? Mm-hmm. Because we know that something's only worth something if there is supply mm-hmm. and demand. If yeah. there's not that for it, it's not worth uh, anything. So yeah. So the yeah the, the answer would be if so he, the answer would yeah. be yes. If he if he is if, if there's demand. Yes. If there's demand to buy that, and he's used it, and it has what's called uh, like in the painting world, we call it a, a provenance. And it like for instance, let's say let's say I did a painting, right? And then Johnny Depp bought it, mm-hmm. and then Johnny Depp sold it to uh, Brad Pitt, mm-hmm. and they had it. And then they basically sold it to a gallery or a museum where it hung in the Louvre. Mm-hmm. Well, that's provenance. That's you know people want to buy yeah. it for that. Like Graceland. Graceland, uh, what's crazy is I was just doing a Who's, research. What's Graceland? Graceland. It's where Elvis Presley lived. Okay. Okay. I was looking at the value of it, and, and it's outrageous the amount that they want to sell that house for, because, or they didn't want to sell it, but what it, the value of it, what mm-hmm. it would be, because Elvis Presley lived yeah, there, and there's so much there. to the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's so much to the story and the provenance. Uh-huh. So remember, you know, an asset is something that 
appreciates over time, like silver, mm-hmm. like gold, you know, like land. You know, land, it's always going to appreciate. They ain't making no more land. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. So if you buy it, odds are in 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to go up in value. Yeah. You know, because there's going to be more demand for it and less because everybody's yeah. building and there'll be less supply. Mm-hmm. That it's, it's really just that simple. So, yeah, no. Are you going to be rich off of it? Is it going to be something that you can you know, do every single day and just paint and go to the bank and paint and go to the bank. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. no, it doesn't, it yeah. doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, but you know, one time examples or one time use of it or, you know, whatever it, that, that's how it works. Mm-hmm. So I would tell him first, find somebody who's in that industry and who knows about what he does and have, have it appraised. Like the people who appraised the artwork, these were not people who just walked in and was like, oh yeah, this is, Ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, I also I also remember the bank's going to reappraise it. That's right. So you can get yep. it repra- appraised and assured, mm-hmm. and then the bank that you used. I remember they yeah. came back in. Yes. They walked yes. through. Well, that's why, like you hear on the comments, people saying like, "Well, they're only going to give you fifty percent of the value of it mm-hmm. of what it's worth." Yeah. Well, of course they're going to because that keeps them safe, mm-hmm. and that's their appraisal. But everything everything has an appraisal to it. This is why when you get into a wreck, you call whoever it is you're calling, Progressive or whoever, and they come right out there, right then with a tablet to see the damage to re appraise what that's worth so they can tell the banks. Exactly. Yeah. That's it's it that that's all that it is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, take your artwork and I would say anybody to I would say anybody who has a collection of artwork whether theirs or somebody else's if it's a collection that they've purchased, I would say get it appraised, you know, um, if you think it's worth something or it has a certain value and then definitely get it insured because if something happens to that, you want to be able to, you know, uh, you know, get your money back off of it yeah. or whatever, you know, just insure it, take care mm-hmm. of it. You know, that's, that's kind of the point of it. And that's what I started doing. It wasn't, it wasn't a plan to necessarily to appraise it, insure it and borrow against it. How I act, how it actually started happening was galleries would not ship your work back and forth unless you had insurance. So mm-hmm. you had to insure it so okay. that if when you shipped it and it broke, that yeah. you had the money. Or when they shipped it back and it broke, mm-hmm. you had it insured and you got the money back for, from the movement of it. Okay. Well, in doing that, I'd spoken with uh, an insurance uh, agent or claims adjuster, and he was like, have you ever had these appraised? And I was like, no. And he was like, oh, you can look at blank, blank, blank. And there were companies you know, that will, and all you have to do, people you know, wanna know, how, how do I get that appraised? All you have to do is look up art appraisal and there's tons of them that come up and you'll see their qualifications as to who they are, um, what they know about art. And there's some that are specific and particular. Like if you do oil painting, there's oil painting appraisers. You know, they won't do acrylic, they won't do watercolor, they won't do sculpture, they won't do, they'll just do that. Um, So the more specific that you can find, the better that it is. And the bigger the company, uh, the better that it is. Um, Like, let's talk about uh, Raymond James. Some people have heard of Raymond James Studios uh, uh, or stadiums and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Raymond James, which is a financial center, they have a ton of assets in art. Mm -hmm. Just Google it and look it up and you'll see it, you know. Yeah. Um, And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of what they you know, one of their things that they yeah, put like in assets joke about, and do. Uh, if you're a local person in Orlando, Florida, um, Raymond James owns uh, the Grand Bohemian downtown. No, that's Kessler. Oh, that, that's Kessler. That's yeah, that's Kessler. Kessler. Okay, owns, so then different story, but same deal. Same deal. Um, yeah, like, exactly. He if owns you go, Kessler, yeah. owns hotels. Uh, Grand Bohemian, downtown Orlando. Mm-hmm. And he owns a couple, I think, in Charleston, South Carolina, and a couple other places. Yeah. But if you go, he has a gallery, and he has a collection of beautiful artwork, some of them from, uh, what's the guy's name, the American illustrator? Dean Cornwell. Dean Cornwell. Yeah, yeah. like this is like a little a little, uh, like a hot spot yeah. for, for Orlando, Florida. You yeah. go to the- I think uh, it's the fifth floor. Uh, it's either the fifth floor or it's the 11th floor. But you could you could go in and ask. You yeah, could ask the yeah, people. Yeah. You go to the front. Yeah. Uh, so it's on uh, Orange Avenue. Yep. It's uh, the Grand Bohemian. Mm-hmm. It's either the fifth or eleventh floor. You can ask the person. They have Dean Cornwell's that. Yep. 
like I make a joke about it all the time, yeah. but like they might be more expensive than the <laughs> like the hotel. Than the ho- thinking, at least yeah. the floor they're on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. So he, yeah. If you don't know who Dean Cornwell is, make sure you Google that. He's yeah. a great American illustrator from the like fifties and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but yeah, again, that's that's how an asset can help you to borrow against or leverage in borrowing, um, and it could be anything. Anything that has value and uh, the bank uses. Like you, even you want to think about how people used to do, um, which I, I used to, you know, I looked at it and researched about it, like um, payday loans. They're taking, they're giving you money for your check. They're not going to give you as much as your check. You know but what I'm saying? Advancing it, yeah. They used to do it with, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, cars. They used to do that. I think they found it illegal maybe in Florida or not. Or not. I don't know if it was illegal, but they stopped doing Just it. unjust, yeah. Yeah, because you know, people would put their car title up for money and then couldn't pay it back, and they would take a car that was triple the amount of what they borrowed against. You know, Again, a HELOC loan, home equity loan. If you have equity in your home, you can borrow against that. That's a certain type of asset that you, you, know, that you have that you can you know, mm-hmm. borrow, leverage, the borrowing power against it, and then get that money and, and do something with it. Uh, but that's basically how it works. It's nothing. Okay. It's no uh, huge, you know, not outrageous. Fraud. Yeah, it's not fraud. <laughs> it's not some huge outrageous thing. But it's very important that artists understand that understand that and know yeah. that as an option. Because if you know where you're going, if you have a target, it's easier to hit it than not having a target at all. If I mm-hmm. say shoot this and there is no this, you'll never hit it. Yeah. So knowing what I'm telling you and then taking the time to research and then creating a plan for yourself of I'm going to create X amount of body of work, 20 paintings or whatever, if they're averaged at $1,000, that gives me $20,000. Mm-hmm. Could I possibly appraise it, borrow against it, and make and get $5,000 to buy new equipment for my studio or whatever, and then pay it back over X, X amount, amount of time? time. It's yeah. that simple. Okay, so wrapping up the podcast, yep. you talk about targets, having targets and everything. Yep. If you give one short and sweet tip for artists or business owners to start branding, Okay. What's their first step? Their first step would be to look at the, because uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to put a link below. I, I would answer those 10 questions that I'm going to ask you mm-hmm. and know who you are. What are your values? You know, everybody has values. Everybody has certain standards that they'll stand for that they're like, I'm not going to do this. I won't sell out for this. Mm-hmm. You know, I won't do this. Just know who you are. Because when you know who you are personally, then you know who to talk to, you know who your tribe is. If mm-hmm. you're like, I don't eat meat, I'm a vegan, don't go trying to talk to people who eat meat and who are hunters. They are not going to resonate with you, and they are not your tribe. Mm-hmm. The quicker that you can figure that out, and I mean do it in not a surface level, but really try to figure that out. And again, guys, I'm going to say it one more time. For years, I thought, oh, that's... That's just goofy thinking, I guess. Yeah, that's how. It wasn't until I stopped, did it, went through it, that I understood the importance you know, of it and, and what it meant to me and what I really wanted to be as a tattooer. Awesome. Well, obviously, thank you for coming out. Thank you for dropping the knowledge for everybody. Absolutely. Um, 100%. And, yeah. I always love doing it. I love talking. I love uh, being able to help artists and people who are in business in general and just resonating with them, uh, you know, I, I enjoy doing that. If anybody has questions or anything, be sure to drop those questions. Uh, like, who was it that dropped the other question? I can't remember his oh, name. Oh, man. I think it's the creature something. Yeah, creature. He does effects. The creature nice. designer, yeah. Creature designer. Thank you for your question, brother. I appreciate it. So, yeah, that's it. I appreciate it, you guys. Uh, thank you so much, and hopefully we'll be doing – as many of these as we possibly can and helping as many, uh, you know, mm-hmm. business owners as well as artists that yeah. we can. And as always, uh, like, follow, subscribe, make comments. Hopefully, uh, if you found something interesting, other people will too, and that's how we get our message out. Share. Thanks, guys. Share.